and welcome to another evening of frank conversation on hard copy here in our Abuja studios. I'm Kayla Magua. Election reforms take our interest this week on the program. Recently, calls were made by the Interparty Advisory Council, the umbrella body of all the political parties in Nigeria, suggesting that election reforms should include the conducting of all elections at all levels, presidential, governorship, national assembly, and state houses of assembly elections in one day. That's not the only election reform being asked for. Some people want state electoral commissions to be scrapped. Some lawmakers want the local government elections to be conducted by INEC. Worries on how the INEC chair is appointed. Diaspora voting. Resolution of pre-election matters before the elections. Issues surrounding party primaries. The Electoral Act, especially sections 60 and 64, regarding collation of results and the definition of the terms transmitted directly or electronically transmitted, and penalties for the breach of election guidelines. My guest tonight helps us navigate this rather murky terrain. He is Senator Sharafuddin Abiodun Ali, Chairman, Senate Committee on Electoral Matters, and representative of your South Senatorial District. Senator Sharafadin Ali, welcome to Hard Copy. Hello. It's good to have you Thanks on the program. Me. Thanks for having Congratulations. me. Congratulations. Uh, you were just elevated to the post of Ekarun Balogun Badi. Um, Badi Olubado. Of Badoland. What does that even mean? What does that mean? Is, what kind of responsibilities does that? Yes, it makes me put on you? A, a member of Olubado in Kasu, the Olubado Advisory Council, which has about uh, twelve or thirteen members. Mm. Uh, apart from Olubado, we are twelve. Uh, before now, as soon as after becoming a mortgagee, if you are lucky to be elevated to become a jagun you become a member of the traditional council. And at that point in time, you can be posted to any of the traditional councils out of the 11 local governments in the battle. As you climb the steps, there are two lines, the civil line and the military line, the Balogun and the Otun line. Both can aspire to become Olubada. One person from this, the next one is this one. So as you climb, you, like, it therefore means that you start from number 45. Okay. Because there's 22 here, 23 here. So you start from number 45, like I did. That was in 2006, July. And then you start climbing. As the elders go, then you climb. You also climb. And now I was elevated. Uh, the additional responsibility now is that uh, you are going to now chair one of the traditional councils in the battle. Oh. I mean, adding that to the work you do as representative of your constituency, you know, it, it is an added advantage, is it not? Well, it's an, it's an additional responsibility. Yeah. Put it that way. Okay. Well, let's get to it. Uh, let's start with that three-day retreat. I remember calling you and you were inside the session when I called. So let's talk a bit about about this retreat. Why why is it holding? Yeah. Thank you very much. I. Remember that when we were inaugurated later, and I was a uh, member and chairman of uh, the Senate committee, the two of us and the chairman in the house decided that the best is for us to have a joint committee. And uh, studying the past laws, especially when everybody in Nigeria felt uh, the electoral 2022 was the best before 2023. But after the election, there were a lot of views and cries as to people pinching holes inside it. So we felt, well, there isn't for us. So we had this technical team, a technical committee, where we had uh, technocrats, election practitioners, who are lawyers, people from INEC, members of uh, the National Assembly, members, lawyers from NEEDS, from the legal, drafting session of the National Assembly where we looked at the law and, and we then decided that the best is to go around the country, get everybody involved, do a lot of consultation than what has been done before. 
And that was so acknowledged at this last TYA that we had by some of the participants. Because we felt uh, there's the need for us to, people get, tend to accept a law more when they are part of the, the making. process, yes. The lawmaking process. So we decided that we do that. We have had two retreats in Lagos. We had a session in Ibadan because we looked at the demography of the last election. There were more youth and women in the elections who mm. voted. So we went to Ibadan at the Southwest uh, Zodaya legislative inter inter interaction there with the youths from across the entire Southwest youth, youth groups, youth organizations. So we had the session in Ibadan for about two days. Thereafter, we went to Paracourt where we had with women, especially as it affects difficult terrains. Okay. So after that, we now decided that, well, next one is, how do we meet our leaders and interpreters who have now been seen to be making laws, which is right anyway, the judges who are there. So we wrote to the judiciary and also to the our political parties. So the first day we had the political parties and they came, came up with their own suggestions. Mm. And like I said at that time, well, it's not sacrosanct. We have had them. We are still go, going to go around the country. We'll go to Casino, go to Bonn, go to almost every zone. From what, I, from what I heard from that program, 35 suggestions? Yes, there are so many. Some have been taken care of by us before. But some judges also came with some other ones. Some the, judges came the up. Justice of, the Justice of Court of Appeal. Yes. They also came. They presented the position paper the next day, the second day. Of, of the suggestions that of they've made. The, that, yes, uh, things that, that they have seen. Which ones, which ones do you think are actionable in, in this year, for instance? It's going to be difficult because uh, some will require constitutional amendments. Which is going on, isn't it? Which is going on, but after the whole exercise, we'll not take it to all the states in the federation and 24 states out of 36 must concur, apart from the National Assembly concur. Because after the exercise, even after our own, we'll take it to the National Assembly. Both houses will have to concur, hmm. I agree. If we have one, then we now, it's not, it will not be sent to the state's houses of assembly. Across that I mean, I want to stay on election, electoral reform. Uh, you know, when, when it comes to the electoral reform conversation that, that's going on right now, one of the things I've heard people talk about is, you know, the state electoral commissions. And many people do not believe that free and fair elections can hold as long as SEC, which is what it's known as, as long as SEC is under the control of governors. You can't have free and fair elections. You can't have proper opposition at local levels. <laughs> so some people are saying, look, scrap SEC, let INEC be the ones to hold elections at those levels. What do you make of that? Well, there are actually three positions. One is saying scrap SEC, let INEC take it over. And with this is a similar neck that we are all complaining about. It means our neck is working. I'm not holding forth for them. Two, some are saying, let's give more powers to SEC. Maybe probably because they are right under the governors. Because whatever they will do under the schedule of the country and their functions, it's, uh, they will do with the governors. Mm. Once we are provided, so that's where the problem is. The third one is let us have a new electoral body that will handle only local government elections. But I think the one that uh, had, uh, more of our people are saying is scrap, INEC, scrap sec, and now have let's have let INEC be conducting the elections. I think is another responsibility. And at the last uh, session we had with the INEC chairman in the National Assembly with the Joint Committee, he said they will be ready. INEC will be ready. To take it on. As Senate Chair on Election Matters, do you support the scrapping of SEC? Well, it depends on the way you look at it. You might think we are talking of restructuring, devolution of powers, and we are still saying this. But looking at the problem that we have had over the years, I would think that the thing should be given to a different body, whether I neck or set up another body. Because we are likely not going to have anything, any semblance of free and fair elections. That's what has been happening, in the last, especially in the last 
10, 15 years. Another question people have when it comes to election reform is about the head of INEC itself. Yes. There are questions as to whether someone who was appointed by the president can actually make decisions that will not favor the president. I remember that the president is a politician. He belongs to a political party. So the idea that the person who runs the election uh, office of Nigeria is appointed by a politician. That is not it, uh, So for many people, they just feel like, look, this is, this is bizarre even. They don't think it, it's possible to have free and fair elections if the person who picked you is a, is, is a politician is as well. Who is impartial? So, so, so for many people, the, the truth is the, this. the argument that they have is that the head of INEC advertise for the role, let people apply, mm -hmm. as opposed to then the who, president. Then, then who will they? And so the, it will go through a rigorous process in yes. their minds. So because INEC is a body that has you know ranks, the process they that can go through, through it and then see if this person is qualified, as opposed to appointing yes, somebody. Do you know the process that goes through before somebody is brought up for an appointment? No, the truth is this. INEC is independent, and that is it's so stated. For us to be able to talk about is a, is a function, is an administrative duty by the president. As soon as INEC chairman or commissioners are appointed, they keep become independent. They are isolated from politics. And uh, this is born out of the fact that the, the, affront, the funding of INEC is a first line charge. The president doesn't have a say on it. As soon as they are given a budget, the money comes directly. It's consolidated fund on a monthly basis. Whether we like it or not, as soon as we have a federal allocation, fund allocation committee, federal allocation uh, missing, the money will go to INEC. There is no problem about it. The problem, we have had a situation in this country and several parts of the world where we have had INEC chairman appointed by Presidents and that president will go for election and will lose election. It happened in 2015, yeah. So it does not, the matter of appointment should not be a problem. It's about the person that is appointed. Some people are complaining, some were, some were, some were politicians. There's hardly anybody that will not, we have political animals. Yes, but not a card carrying member of it a political be, no, party. No part, there is nobody. Who is seen actively taking part in political Th rallies those and Those ones things. are not supposed to be. But anybody in Nigeria, people make comments, you, okay, like you go on social media, I personally can make, you can make, you don't carry, I don't think you carry the card of any political party. And the fact that you now make comments when you are found to be fit for an appointment. Some people now come up, this is what she said this day, this is what she said. These are things that you are just voicing as an opinion. So the issue of appointment of INEC, I think it, we should better leave it the way it is today. Part of the, part of, part of the conversations that you've had recently are with the, the judiciary, which is another, for, for, me, for some people, they feel like that is the biggest chink in, in the chain of having free and fair elections in Nigeria. There's a conversation, I think uh, IPAC brought it up uh, in your retreat, resolution of election matters before the elections, as opposed to us having elections and then, oh, there was a matter before, and then he comes in and then we start to That's wonder. That's one of the suggestions made by the, just, the, just the president of the Court of Appeal. So the Court of Appeal, they also have, they also have that we are, suggestion. We are, it has also been part of what we are doing, saying that pre-election matters should be concluded before the election. So you agree with this? And elections... Deep schools on elections should be concluded before inauguration or taking of vote. Because like that, we have, it won't be somebody has been there, we will remove the person, or somebody has been there, one federal court will now come up with a story of two years ago and now get the person. I know that's not right. And the issue of party primaries as well came up in your conversation. Yes. So, so what can be done about that? Because, you know, for many people, this is, a, this is an inter-party issue. What are you going to do? Force them to do the right thing at the right time? No, I think the way it is... Some people okay. actually believe that what, we should, what should happen is the guidelines be given to these political parties. You know what the rules are. And if you breach any of these election guidelines, the penalty should include you being disqualified from the that process. There is a penalty already. Yeah. What we, people are thinking now is that there should be financial penalty monetary for any officer that is involved. But that is neither here nor there. 
Because to be able to be pin down anybody for that, it's just the party. It's the party, and the punishment is that that party will not be able to fill the candidate in the in subsequent the election. election, in the election that is a rerun or something. And I think that's enough for the sprint. Let's talk about it. Diaspora voting, special elections, <laughs> prisoners voting. Where, where are we in that conversation? Yes, we, for special elections, I keen to it fully. And, uh, but we have to look at it. If you're talking about prisoners, it must be prisoners that will be serving a fairly long term. Because if somebody is here, in six months will be out, and you get, you get him registered as a voter here, it's of no use. He may have to go back to the cell to, go back to, to, to vote. Or to, uh, so that's the uh, out of it. Also for hospitals, we could, we could also do all this. But for that poverty, uh, there's a snag. And the snag is, do we have enough data to be able to know the number of Nigerians that are outside the country? If you say we should, people who are working in our embassies across the world, who is going to pay them the cost? You know, they pay the foreign currency. The parties will have to have agents that will go there. INEC will send people. All this is not adding more to our costs, but that's not even a problem. When we go electronically, going electronic voting, that can be done. But looking at the other one, because we don't have the data of Nigerians across the world. Like before the Sudan crisis, could we have ever imagined that Nigeria had that number of people in that country? If you go to Malaysia, go to the number of people there, whether illegal or illegal, which who are to vote? Is it legal immigrants or illegal immigrants? This is where we have problems. And so another thing is that somebody is in the United States, for example, has not been to Nigeria in the last 15 years, does not know what happens there. He just, whatever he, is, he or she, she's on social media, is the same, and they believe. This may have an effect on the election. We must be prepared for it. And this takes also to the technology that we're talking about. Our, our own advice is that let us take it slowly. Let's get there. Because uh, like the last election, because I know you get there. You're going to get there. Talking about transmission. I was actually going to go there. That was actually my next question. <sighs> section 60 and Section 64. For this electoral act, that 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 that's that's something that many Nigerians, they, in fact, for many people, they're just watching. They don't believe in the process anymore no. because it, it felt like, it felt like they understood it in one way, but in practicality, it was something else. Explain that to us because the, the story is that says, those two sections are vague; they're, they're not, not clear. Vague. One it says that it will transmit the electoral after giving copies, recording doing everything, giving to political parties and security agencies, will now transmit in the manner prescribed by the commission. It's not in the INEX something that they will do and transmit it to the IRF. But we all knew what happened. The INEC had a complaint, had other issues. They said there were over 2,000 attempts at hacking their system. Let's look at this instance. If, for example, a party that is the lowest in the ladder, don't let us be any big political parties, if somebody is able to hack the system and post results, which makes the party that we all know couldn't have gotten anything, puts him at the top. Won't, be there, won't there be a crisis in Nigeria? Secondly, are you sure that the presiding officer has charged his phone? And this happening, this leader has been there since morning. The copper has been there since morning. By two o'clock or three or four o'clock, when they are doing it, is the battery, if the battery is not off, will it be able to snap and transfer? We have problem of electricity, the issue of network in remote areas. These are things that that's why we felt that we should take it slowly. We couldn't get there in a day. All the other countries that we are talking about, they didn't get there in a day. And most of the things when I was, I was in Liberia, it was 80% manual. 
And it was acceptable by the people. Yeah, so same thing in Syria alone. Uh, in in uh, South Africa. No, the Omar Fire is Senegal. Senegal. It was mostly manual. But well, no. me and you want, we monitor the elections in South Africa. So, yes. How much difference is there between their years of democracy and our years of democracy? We saw them do electronic voting. We uh, how many times? How elections. many times did they? We saw all these things. They were able to work. Yes, they were hitting. Were they using generators in South Africa? No. So, so, so we, we, what we'll are the things that. that are peculiar to us? Because we, we I've said it. The pe things that How are peculiar you? to us. Why can't we network fix issues. them so that we can be on the same level we as we'll this get country by doing well? When? When? Okay, let me give you an example. Mm. I will, you are right beside me. I will call your number and we say it's not achievable. And your line is on. So these are the kind of things. We have to get all these things right. I can tell you that we are making progress. Everything is still working progress. What kind of progress have we well, made? Well, what we are doing at our own level, at our committee, is working progress. And you can, I can tell you that what we had in 2015, there was an improvement in 2019. By 2023, there was an improvement. But because what happened in 2023 was that a lot of people were interested in that election, especially because of what the way neck came up with it and the beavers, which we all know was a game changer. The issue of snatching ballot boxes and all, these are things of the past. We are moving, though slowly. And it's better to be slow and steady than to run and stumble. As Senate Chair on Election Matters, if there was something in our electoral process that you believe would, if we can handle this, We'll get everything else right. Could you give me an example of something like that? Network issues. That's, all. That's why I said technology. It's just technology. It's that technology is that is the main problem that we have now, apart from personality. Technology. If you're able to get that right. So two problems will. you've mentioned now, personalities and technology. But essentially technology. Because we, the human factor there, we can easily detect by ourselves. But you have technology as long as we get that right. But, and that's why we are getting it right. It was an, the ingenuity of INEC that they came up with uh, the beavers and that to dispense with the smart card reader. You know the problems we had with the smart card reader, the incident forms, where we have, they will tell you the smart card reader is not working, you're not using the forms. At the end of the day, you see most of them are not right or are not done properly. People could not, who are not supposed to, or a lot of things we had, but that one did not happen in 2023. But because a lot of people's interests have been generated, so they felt, ah, why again? At the end of the day, all these things, well, all these results were on IREV. The only thing is that if they were not there, by second, third day, the thing, at least for my own election, by second, third day, it was there. The main problems essentially were the presidential. For the National Assembly elections, I think the first, second day, it was there. Even before declaration of results, it was already on the IRF. Let's talk a bit about the elections, the upcoming ones in Edo Ed and Undo. Are you going to be monitoring those as well? Yes, we will be even before the election, we're likely to go there on oversight. The Joint Committee will be going there. Uh, but from what we have had, and that's one of the reasons why the INEC chairman came to be voiced in the National Assembly, the INEC is well prepared for the elections. What about the personalities? Ah, well, it's for the people there to decide. Do you suspect the, any kind of shenanigans? No, happen, any I don't kind of think violence? that should not be. That I, I do not think. And because we have asked INEC to also engage the security agencies. Because that's one of the major problems that we have elections in Nigeria. The only other problem that they had and they have solved that was the flooding of the office in Benin. And INEC had taken and the, I remember the Minister for Works as, assured that he's going to work on it. You did something very interesting in the National Assembly recently. If I was a joint committee uh, which you had uh, alongside uh, yeah, Honorable Balogun. Honorable Balogun. Uh, and one of the things that I heard you talk about was a reduction in pay for legislators, you were asking for a thirty percent reduction on one level. Mm, it was forty percent well, reduction. Forty percent uh, reduction for executives. It's just so we can understand what what no, really the happened. The thing is this: 
it's uh, something that was done in person. And the only person who can talk about that is a Senate spokesperson. If uh, we all know things are very hard in the country, the president himself accepted that. If that is what is going to assuage, to some extent, the feeling of Nigerians, so be it. Thank you so much, Senator, for being with us on Hard Copy. And good luck with all the work that you do. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. And for Nigerians, I thank you so much for listening and watching. We have been speaking about election reforms with Senator Sharafuddin Ali, Chairman, Senate Committee on Electoral Matters, and Representative of your South Senatorial District. Please join the conversation online at channelcv.com. We love to hear from you. I'm Kayla Magua. Good night.